Thank you so much for the very kind introduction. So I'm sharing some work me and my team and my collaborator have been doing for the last 10 years called Revertical Data Science. Revertical means truthful. So we're in the age of AI. This is a code I picked up in the media about 2019. Bill Gates said AI is like nuclear energy, both promising and dangerous. And that really characterizes how I see AI pretty well. And most of the AI advancements in recent time have been data driven. So that puts data science at the center of AI. And data science has computer science, math stats with machine learning belong to both field, and then domain knowledge. It's really um, kind of modern statistics, applied statistics as well. And I like to ground uh, this talk in a particular collaboration has been going on for the last five years. So this is a huge team of people. We responded to a Chang Zuckerberg Biohub into a campus research award, which demanded that we have people from UC Berkeley, UCSF, and Stanford, and to form a team and write a proposal. So my main collaborator had been the guy with the tie, Ewan Ashley, cardiology from Stanford, and his junior colleague now went to a startup, James Priest, the guy with white coat, and the two young people I want to have a called out, Ching Ru Wang, who is a postdoc with Ewan, and um, Tiffany Tan, who uh, just graduated and then my supervision now post at Michigan will be Notre Dame. So this is a project we try to go from uh, medical problem, data science, and experiment. So it belongs to the whole, I have the whole pipeline, try to understand vascular health. And the particular problem actually we concentrated on actually was not in the proposal. We had to change to a different heart condition because the initial ones didn't yield any signal. So in the end, we end up working on this hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is a genetic heart disease happens in one five, in 500 people in the US. And Ewan, my main collaborator is an expert. So this is a condition where if you look at the left ventricle on the right, the joint of the heart, the second heart well is a symptom of this disease, right? So it makes the heart pumping very difficult and you can faint, you can die. And people previously have studied show this genetic component and the cell size within that wall is really um, a good phenotype to study this problem. That's what we're gonna use. So my team came in with something we already developed called iterative random forest with my um, collaborator Lang like Ben Brown from UC Berkeley. We already had that, so that's our part. So our goal was to do recommendations to identify genetic interactions and genetic driver of this problem, and then for them to do experiments. So it's really not to say that we have p-value less than something and that's done. It's really tried to be a recommendation system and try to reduce the design space so that they can search a little less and few experiments with high yields. So you have typical problem, what genes react to drive HCMI, <clears throat> what data use, we decide to use UK Biobank. And that's very um, homogeneous um, population, right? So whatever discovery needs to be validated in other ethnic groups. How to clean, we didn't have to do much either because this is already cleaned. For other problem, cleaning is a huge issue. And then you have the typical modeling and interpretation evaluation. And for us, evaluation is really an experiment. And in every step of this data science life cycle, humans are always there making this judgment calls. Why didn't we use a Japan biobank, right? We might use different genetic interact because different ethnic group. So all of that is human making judgment calls. We might end up with different results. And the data science life cycle <coughs> depicted here as many, many steps. The main problem, as I said, every step is a source of uncertainty because of human judgment calls. And this process view of data science or statistical analysis has been expressed in the literature by Box, Cox, and Snell, and now there are many people. So it's not just one step of modeling, it's a process. Uh, uncertainty quantification is central to statistics and for building trust in the AI, right? If you do genetic counseling, you said, my chance of getting a particular prostate cancer or something is 90%. And then you might take it very seriously. You said, my, conf my uncertainty interval is from zero to 100. That basically doesn't say anything, right? So without uncertainty quantification on one of the trustworthy one, it's very hard to interpret the point estimate. 
But the current approach in statistics usually is about generating stochastic model. You have probability distributions, and we're looking at sample to sample variabilities, and with limited empirical checking. And in data science lifecycle, there are many other sources, mainly due to human judgment calls. So we really need to expand the uncertainty quantification to consider other things. So I think you know, how's uncertainty, which is a fundamental for trustworthy AI, I would like to be able to address the uncertainty from data cleaning and team effect. It means different individuals with the same data, similar domain knowledge, and are choosing different modeling approaches and end up with different results. So to bring these messages home, uh, two years ago, I did a final project in my class. Here, my helpers listed there that we look at data set for a children traumatic brain injury and three teams clean the same data each team we find the medical doctor collaborator to work with them so some domain knowledge with the same guidelines and we said don't talk to each other and then you can see that if you look at the different choices made by people the teams we duplicated that for like 10 times. Roughly speaking, the uncertainty from data cleaning choices with the same guidelines is similar in magnitude to uncertainty from bootstrap samples from each clean data set. So this means it's substantial. And one team cleaned away 23% of the data and they got the best result on the clean data, right? So all of that we don't really talk about. So that's why we need to take that into account. And then there's this paper, it's a perfect um, case made why we need to do something like PCS. 160 some social scientists belong to 73 teams of people who work on the same data, they didn't worry about data cleaning, and to test the same social science hypothesis about immigration, whether that will reduce public support for government uh, of social policies. And they got results all over the place, very positive, very negative. And the, this is not like Kaggle. They really screen the team to make sure they are competent, not anybody want to. So it's, it's not like just anybody who could do it. And they also recorded a lot of the process of different team. And they tried to do a NOVA or something to understand why would might have driven these different conclusions. They couldn't really have. Course, they couldn't really have. It's just all these kind of arbitrary, you know, reasonable choices people make. So this, there's a similar paper with similar message in finance. People try different methods and get very different results. So to gain trust in and maximize promise of data science and AI, data conclusions must capture reality, that's model checking, and stable to human judgment calls through the integrated data science life cycle. So we used to tell factory people they need to do quality control. I think we need to do quality control our own process and which is built on empirical uh, practice. And then for the success empirical process, we might be able to do some theory to understand better. So for the rest of the talk, I'll formally introduce the PCS framework has been in making for the last 10 years. And documentation is a huge part of PCS. P means predictability, computability, and stability. It's very much try to marry machine learning with the build one framework or one culture, you know, from the O'Brien two culture paper. And the PCS framework, it's one way to achieve very vertical data science. You can have other ways. So vertical data science is much broader uh, umbrella. You can use the PCS framework to develop new methods because some methods is not stable enough. So you add stability with a good predictive method and stability is a minimum requirement for interpretability. And now return to after the new method, e Random Forest actually came out 2018. We have to do many, um, like extra things for very low signal case. Then we go back to the uh, HCM problem, but the cardiology problem, and with RF recommendation and intervention experiments. And then I will mention another study use PCS for pancreatic cancer risk prediction, which have been engaged with um, quite a few uh, cancer researchers. And now I'll finish with where we are and also talk about extensions by other people. So the PCS framework, I already introduced that. And the starting point is Leo Brahman. So Leo Brahman was a huge influence uh, on me, kind of uh, really tried to track me to machine learning. He was one of the early people really jumped into machine learning and tried to understand boosting all of that. 
And he kind of made this dichotomy of aggression culture, machine learning, and statistical culture. We will think deep learning is more machine learning. I think machine learning is more than statistics. You can see deep learning is also a modern statistics. And usually people think p-value, t-test, a kind of statistics, and PCA try to build a bridge and unify it into one culture. So the paper came out uh, now four years ago with my former student, Kang Kun Beer, who has been at UCSF and finishing postdoc doing a startup on neurodegenerative disease. And it's really tried to take predictability, which was put in the center of data analysis by machine learning people. Of course, this is, we did prediction, but it was not the first thing, right? The first thing, if you think this is in your courses, it's not about prediction. It's about model fitting, it's about parameter estimation, all of that. So take that as a generic model checking, and we have been expanding the predictability for reality check, because often just average accuracy is not enough. And computability model taking from machine learning, and stability is a huge expansion on sample to sample variability. I didn't use the word robust, robustness because robust statistics has a particular meaning. It's really robustness. And stability also is a concept in control theory and numerical analysis. It's kind of unifying. So in one slide, PCS is trying to synthesize. If you see bits of your ingredients, what you do already, it's wonderful. This is not saying everything's new, but there's some new things. Unify streamlines, expands on ideas, best practice in both machine learning and statistics. We really try to give a name, build a platform, so we can work together to all this for vertical data science. So I started a pass on loving stability with the opportunity to give a two key lecture for Bernoulli Society. At the time, I was working on Lasso, trying to interpret Lasso as a neuroscience problem. I think just not stable. Did the 10% of the data, Lasso give you different important features. And then two key did a lot of stability, I would say robustly relative to different models, right? One the measure of the center of distribution, which works when you have long tail or short tail. It's really model perturbation. So put it together, say, well, let's ask both data perturbation and model perturbation stability. And this was in the background of a lot of people working on reproducible uh, research, right? All these people, it's like a lot of uh, discussion about reproducible research. And later, I wanted to explain the AI interval machine learning of file stability is also a prerequisite for uh, interval machine learning. So my view of stability expanded over the last 10 years. In the beginning, it's about modeling. I didn't worry about data cleaning. And the more I think about it, the more like, you have to look at the whole data science life cycle. And then the word actually picked up because five, six years ago, I was co-teaching one of the early data science classes and my CS colleague were using data science life cycle. I thought that's really good to describe the process. So I started using that and realized if you do data science life cycle, there's a, even linguist stability, right? You know, carry center, you have this multidisciplinary people. If you have a cancer researcher, matrix is a biological structure in cancer research. It's not just a tabular data. ML, remember when I was a graduate student, that means maximum likelihood. Now ML is machine learning. So even at the linguistic level, we need stability. So different people can discuss. And then for visualization, you can choose different plots. You might get different impressions. So all of that, we should make it easy to do different plots of the same data. So people can try different things and find something stable. And I should say, this is what you want. And then you have to write a document about it. So this is not trying to prescribe what you should, you should not do is really a philosophy, guidelines for you to implement and write a documentation to argue for one position versus the other. And stability is also key to theory, right? I came actually from a very theoretical background and I learned central limit theorem by Fourier characteristic factory. And Terence Tao, the field medalist, has seven different proofs of central limit theorem on his website. And one version is called Lindbergh swapping trick. You have X1, X1, N, I, D. You construct Y1 through Y, N, I, D. Gaussian means zero match everything. You just swap each X by the Ys and use tele expansion to control the different, the perturbation. And then you, after swapping everything, you have I, linear combination, I, D, Gaussian. You have a central limit theorem, right? So this is really essence of central limit theorem. And for random matrix, right, you don't see normal distribution anymore, but you still have this uh, perturbation arguments. So that's more essential than the Gaussian distribution, right? There's many different things uh, people using machine learning as well. So it's really a key concept 
also in theory. So people say like human judgment calls. If you try all possibility, you never go home. So that's why reasonably documentation comes into play, right? So I have a phone, I drop it, I open do, it shouldn't break. If I go to the 10th floor, I drop it. That's not a reasonable perturbation. So maybe for a spy or something, their phone should survive, I don't know, right? But it's really like you have to really use the documentation to say why this is a reasonable perturbation. Maybe you can argue traditionally, the data could have like collected the other way. Oh, this is a reasonable data cleaning. You, you keep all the variables with 30% of um, more than 30% of non-missing values, but now why not 35%? So all of that, you can do some perturbation and see whether the result will change. So the typical statistical perturbation all apply, but there's some new ones we try to put under. Modality choices. If you use protein data or genomic data, do you get the same result if you only use genomic data? Which database you use? And data cleaning. As I showed you, right, you often get different results, even with the same guidelines. So our book, I have a book with Rebecca Barter, my former student, we have a whole chapter about that. Synthetic data, right? You can also add data from PDEs to help you to make things more stable, like shrinkage towards the manifold. So all of that is under the stability consideration. Sometimes you seek stability, sometimes you add stability by um, adding some um, data set, do data augmentation. Oh, data under different environment in causal inference, people often seek causal relations under different environments. So that's a perturbation by environment and different privacy. It quickly got adapted, maybe too quickly by uh, US census. And data augmentation and adversary attacks, right? If I drop my phone, that's a very adversary attack on my phone, right? For certain circumstances, you, you want that, but usually that's too much. And then if you look at model perturbation, What's reasonable perturbation, right? Uh, robust statistics, trim mean, you know, median, semi parametric model, you look at different distributions. The sewer ridge, you can do ridge and do truncation, you still do model selection. And modes of empirical minimization, sensitivity and that's in Bayesian modeling, and that's a form of perturbation. And from different initialization, when you train deep learning, you might end up these different models. So unless you say this is the right initialization, you, you're allowed to do it, but you write a document about it. Obviously that's how other people do. So just give more explanation to go with what you do. And as I alluded to earlier, this, this is the exponential explosion of possibilities. So you have, still have to make judgment calls. And there's already work in um, Gaumann, Loken 2014, they talk about forking, right? And if you really think the two Paths uh, have different weight you should put on, you're kind of going to Bayesian thinking already. You could do that because uh, this is more trustworthy, but I still want to try this. And you should at least do two paths, I would say, right? If you don't have the energy to do more, but at least do two paths. So I'm advocating keep two versions of clean data at least and record everything through documentation. So documentation is a big integral part of the species framework. Models are mental constructs and reality are reality. Do you think there's a Golden Gate Bridge there? You don't see it actually. So you have to view the bridge. I don't know when, probably it was there. The photo probably was not taken when the bridge was not made, but we don't see it. So you have to build the bridge by having quantitative and qualitative uh, arguments, including what are the judgment calls. And we have a template you can start with to do for your field. It's on my website, the first page. We did it with uh, MD Anderson cancer researchers. We just basically wrote out a documentation for them to do. Actually, we didn't do any of the detailed analysis. Basically, we were advisory. We made the document and they filled it in and they really um, liking it. So PCS is actually a very uh, ambitious research program for data science. It's philosophical, conceptual, practical, and standing on basic principles, we might want to add more. That's all uh, fine. It's a systems approach, integrating different steps and look at the quantification of uncertainty, not just at the modeling stage, but also earlier stages. And the PCI documentation is really, really important. 
and it's left necessarily vague because a lot of decisions I cannot make for you. You have to think in context about what's reasonable perturbations and with your limited resources too, right? So that's in the documentation. And if your lab is doing ideas in PCI already, that's great. But I still think even for my group, we do some of that we're a lot more systematic and it's easier to explain to uh, beginners what needs to be done than just, oh, by the way, you should do this, by the way, you should do that. Of course, this came from my experiences uh, doing data analysis and teaching. And uh, hopefully um, you will find it useful to even do a lot of this stability stuff and model checking already. So beyond what I'll talk about next, we have many other success stories. We developed a new method, which I'll describe next. e random forest came from genomics. We also use stability to select number of components in non nature matrix factorization. We also have uh, subgroup selection in randomized trials, statistics, and many other things. And I will tell you about the epistasis gene recommendation for cardiology. We also work with clinicians in ER rooms to, to stress test. That's another role you can do, even look at papers. So you read the paper already published. You can use the principle to say, what are the steps the uh, papers didn't take. If you look at my paper, I'm sure it's something I didn't do either. And also to look at the decision rules and redo the analysis, see whether you can reproduce similar results. Actually, they pass pretty well. It's a decision rule to send kids to CT scan or not for uh, abdominal uh, injury in ER room. And they did very well. We basically uh, supported their analysis and also have external studies. But when we do cardiology, actually, we have to do a lot more than the RS. We call low surf. That means for low signals, we have to add a lot more stability. And other people have expanded to uh, spatial statistics, network analysis, and reinforcement learning. So let me um, talk about this uh, iterative random forest development. This is something actually was concurrent when we develop the framework. So usually, I uh, do things in context. I have two scientific collaborations to hash out a lot of the ideas we later put in the framework. One is this project, the other is on, on neuroscience, we call deep tune. So to see whether the ideas make sense. And now it seems like application, but actually um, this was the motivating case study. So about almost like eight years ago, Ben Brown, who is a Berkeley colleague, came to me and said, well, let's have a joint postdoc together. We hired uh, Sumanta Basu, and Carl was my student, but really also Ben's student worked together for this problem that he was working on genomics. So at the time, random forest was giving, was giving very good results for prediction for disease status and things like that. But they were facing a hard problem of instability. So people already tried to interpret the features on the same path in a tree, in a random forest as interacting. But nothing was stable, so they couldn't interpret. So that's what I was brought in um, and the band's suggestion to start working on this. So the problem we're facing genomics harder than uh, computer vision. Computer vision, you know you're looking for a cat. You actually know what the cat looks like. In genomics, we don't know what our cat looks like. We think there's a cat or there's something, but we don't know what it looks like. So it's a lot more search than just identification. It's discovery. And we also know from a Drosophila biology and other biological results that the interaction is not just pairwise. It can go to false order, at least. And if you do the statistical way, main effects, pairwise interaction, and so on and so forth, you quickly have expansion of terms and you run out of computation resources. And often, genomics, the genes don't have main effects, but they have interaction effects. So you want to bypass some of the main effects. And also, the polynomial form doesn't quite work. And there's this biological model called French uh, flag model. It says that. <laughs> For two transcription factors, which is in the central dogma, one after DNA, you have RNA, and you have transcription factor to transcribe into proteins, they have to reach certain abundance before they interact, right? When you talk about genes, not just one entity, many little guys play the role of a gene. So there's so much randomness in cellular biology that you have to have lots of them for things to happen. So that's the called uh, thresholding behavior. And this is well captured by decision rules, right? This is thresholding. So mathematical, this is a good matching. And Leo Brahman already had this paper called Random Forest, which also built on other people's work, saying that when you construct a decision tree like CART, 
at each split, you uniformly sample m tri of them. Suppose you have p of them, but you don't might be smaller uniformly, and then you choose the best split among the ones you selected, and then you have after loop of bagging, and that's how you do random forest. So as I said, people already looking at two features on the tree being maybe interact, but nothing was stable. So we decided to add stability. So this is P, it's a method doing really well for prediction, right? PCS, computation is implicitly there. And then we're adding the S. We want to make random forest more stable. So what we did is to iterate random forest. The first is just do random forest. And at the end of the first iteration, you're gonna have importance measures, MDI. From random forest. You can replace with other importance measure. And then you up sample and down sample. So when you do the second iteration, you do M try, you don't do uniform selection anymore. You use the importance measure to up and down sample. So this is soft dimensionality reduction. And you uplift some of the now the top ones just by chance they get to be picked. But the very, very unimportant one, you don't get much of a chance either. So you still have have some marginal, at least importance marginally for, for us to see it. And then we use random intersection trees to find intersections That's, that can be deterministic. It's like you have all these paths now, and can we see how many times two genes fall on the same path? That's a kind of accounting problem. And then we have after loop begging to assess the stability score. So how many times um, each and gene gene interaction get appeared. So this is a Drosophila problem for enhancer prediction. And I'll be brief because I want to talk about the cardiology. You can see that we have three iterations. AUC on test had basically the same. We didn't lose much predicting accuracy. On the right-hand side, you have on the vertical axis, you see red, there are abbreviations of names of genes in Drosophila. GT means giant, HP means hunchback, these are famous genes to, to make um, like the segmentation for Drosophila. So we find 20 pairwise interaction, which are about 50%. And the blue ones are three-way interactions. And it turns out that in the literature, because we have Drosophila uh, collaborators, they point us to literature that 80% of the 20 pairwise interactions already people did experiments show they are real interactions. So have a high yield. And then the blue ones become recommendation. So that's the technology where people can really see by the three-way interaction, we become a recommendation system. And then we took another five years to make it a more refined version. So we have something called surf means signed. So in the beginning, we just say this gene gets split. We say yes. But now we're going to say is that larger than something or smaller, positive, negative. So it's very similar. We call sign. And then CAR became a postdoc at the UCSF group. So it took a long time, and we really want to bring our results with better data in the enhancer for Drosophila to bring to the public. So we finally had a browse a browser track. That's UC Santa Cruz genome browser track. Other Drosophila scientists can look at our results and help them to do experiments. So what we try to do is really towards causal, right? We want to know which genes drive HCM, but we have association analysis. But with stability, we're moving a little closer to causality. So I think causality is really a whole spectrum. It's not yes or no, it's really about evidence. And I like this definition of causality by Nancy um, Carwright, who's uh, I think a philosopher or cognitive scientist at the UCSD. She said that causality is really about whether there's enough evidence for you to act. It's about taking action. So you have a whole spectrum of Hooke's law, right? Physics laws is the best we know about causality, right? It's very reproducible, stable, but still if you get unlucky, you have a string which is old, you put a load on it, it breaks. It's not 100%, but it's very reproducible. On the other stream, you have FDA kind of mentality, average treatment effect, it's an average property. We're going in subgroups, but still we're kind of not at the individual level. And what we try to do is, we add a lot of stability to predictability analysis. And then we generate a hypothesis, and then we verify it through experiments. To compare with the CI causal inference with the traditional um, framework, the way we do it, we don't claim we have causality, we call recommendation. And 
a lot of the causal inference based on observational study don't do a lot of model checking. And we do, we do p-screening, right? We do prediction. And causal evidence is often used domain knowledge and assumptions made. And we actually do stability analysis to really get evidence. And they don't usually ask to do intervention experiments. And we say, yes, we're only doing recommendations. So there's similarities and differences. And just one plugin for our theoretical work. So we actually devised a theoretical model we called LSS, local spicy sparse, was used to simulate a lot of data to design RF because we only have two data sets. I want to save one for external study. And we end up using this linear combination Boolean function as a simulation model. It really helped us to devise the method. We use the X from the real data and we simulate this structure, which is captured the biological um, process, like each Boolean interest like a pathway. But this, we have to assume things are independent. We have all assumptions, we have a theoretical version of RF. Actually, you can show this is nonlinear model selection consistent. So this new model could be useful for other people too, to study instead of just a Lipschitz model. This is actually a biological um, foundations. Okay, back to the uh, HCM. Any questions? So this is a very low signal noise problem because the UK biofgun people are in their 50s and 60s. And the hard size, the worst I had a lot to do with the environmental factor, like how would you eat and all of that, right? So it's very noisy. And we had to actually go back to the drawing board because the phenotype which is the label HCM from UK Biobank had yielded no information. It was very noisy because a lot of people we think had the disease was not diagnosed. And now we have to really add more stability to the um, RF. And then we did the gene silencing experiment. So as I said, a couple of months, so I, I took my team, we did the first positive uh, control with red hair. That was successful because it's very clear signal. So right before the pandemic happened in the US, I took my team and spent a week with you and Ashley just crossed the bay in Stanford. Right away we came back, everything shut down. It was end of February 2020. And then we used a label first, a couple months, no signal. We basically couldn't beat 50%. So we went back to the drawing table and then somebody Western from you and Ashley have to go to the MR images and calculate the volume of the left ventral wall, use somebody else, um, um, deep learning method. And then we normalize use heart and weight because big people have big hearts, right? And then we got a new um, phenotype, which is continuous, which is a normalized uh, kind of left ventricle war a volume. And then we had a problem because I want to follow the PC, I want to do model checking. And we don't know whether that fit error prediction error is good enough, it's just noise, right? Because we don't know what's the noise level for this problem. So what you end up with is to discretize, which also makes signal clear. We took the top size and the bottom size, the normalized, and we made it into a binary classification problem. Because for a binary classification problem, we have to at least beat 50%. Right before with HCM label, we couldn't. And we tried top 20, 15, 25, we got consistent 55%. It was very low. If you look at P values, we have some robust version of you know, PCF here we can do, nothing passes 5%. But the ranking, because we're doing recommendation, the ranking was too informative. That was a surprise. We basically closed our eyes and said, let's do experiments. So we had a failure with the Drosophila problem. After some or not that work I told you, we also had um, the, the collaborators, Sue Seneca, that was very nice, wanted to do experiments. And we're not as careful. We use correlation network. They did 40 experiments. They're still sitting on some shelf. We couldn't make anything out of it because we don't know what's the phenotype. The, the experiment was not well designed. We did discover a very important gene because if you knock out that gene, the embryo dies in 16th hour. But our conjecture based on correlation network is wrong. And we, we need to go back to some experiment because we're told if this is a second rate uh, journal paper, nobody's interested. But so it's still unresolved. So this time we're a lot more careful to put people into experiments. But it's very, very low. Drosophila data is very clean because the Drosophila, the fruit flies are great 
bred in exper you know, in labs, very pure bred, all of that, right? It's very pure, but this is human, human uh, older age, very, very noisy. So UK Biobank data have this um, SNP data. I don't know how many of you know. SNP is really a way to characterize our difference from the majority. When you look at that position with a blue box, if zero, that means you agree with the majority of the population. One means one copy is different, two means different. So this characterizes your individualism relative to majority. So if you have, if you have disease, maybe that's what tells you. And this is 15 million, even though many are imputed. Our RF actually cannot run on 15 million features. And those are things too noisy anyway, even you can run, just you don't have the statistical signal to tell them apart. So we did dimensionality reduction using the traditional GWAS, which is linear method called BOT, uh, so kind of random effects related, Plink, who are two leading GWAS methods. You basically do look at each gene at a time. We took the top 1,000 from both and put them together because we don't want to miss anything. We don't want to trust one with the other. So we'll get about 1,500 SNPs. And then we run RF with binaryized uh, phenotype. And then nothing was stable at the SNP level because too many of them. So we aggregated the interaction at the gene level. So if SNP one, because we have a map from each SNP can be mapped into a gene region. So we collected the interaction at the gene level and we saw stability. If you go to the SNP, nothing is stable. We have the same problem. So we have to add that and we have to do dimensionality reduction, both of them. We didn't have to do for Drosophila. It's just the, the, the signal was so clean. And now we end up with six genes. TTN is a T10, it's a well-known muscle gene. And IGF1R is a growth factor gene. People kind of know that. And there's interesting new genes, the CCDC141, very close to Titan. A lot of time people thought they probably act together, but what we discovered with the experiment, they have interaction. They don't always act together. And the other three, we just end up not using because we want strong signals. And we had our rankings. So that's also one thing we learned from the Drosophila interaction. Before, Actually, when we had this 20 gene, gene interactions, we actually submitted the paper and the ref said, why? This is good. That's all our collaborator liked it. She said it was good. And we realized we're not very rigorous, which is, she might be just nice to us. So we went back and she did have all the you know, journals to give us. So it was fun. Then we learned that we should not just give the domain expert the list we like. So we want to trick them a bit. So we give them now three lists. The top ranked ones, middle ranked ones, and random ones. And so far, our collaborator all passed. You don't want them to, if they're not good scientists, they probably might go for, for the random ones because you can always come up with some story, right? It's not hard to come up with some story. So this is what we call domain X or penis listed with negative controls. We now, that's what the protocol we follow, which we didn't for the Drosophila. We just say, oh, you're happy, okay, good. Because people have confirmation bias, we all do. So you try to push back. And then we did a lot of uh, annotated database search. I won't bore you with that. Just we did it. And, and, and Chad Waldi was a cardiology fellow who worked with us very closely together and Tiffany and myself. So we did many of these are the names of um, annotated databases we searched. But all the annotated database functionality is only on marginal. You cannot find interactions. So we had to rely on own evidence for interactions. So we ended up doing five sets of experiments. <laughs> And Chen Ru, who was a mechanical engineer PhD with Nate, who was an undergraduate, prepared the, uh, the sample. Um, basically prepared the samples, it's like stem cells. You can grow muscle, heart muscle um, cells from this basically stem cells. And the stem cell, the muscle cell you grow, is not like elongated like in our body. It's round because it's in a dish. So we can measure the diameter as a measure of the size. Remember I mentioned people already believe the cell size matter might be driving the bigger heart wall. And um, we did gene silencing, which is not knockdown, not CRISPR, it's cheaper. And so that's what they did. And then Qian Ru divided this really cool machine to sort the cells and count. So she became an AI expert and had all this segmentation 
stuff and, and I said, can we reanalyze data? They were not, they let us reluctantly because they have been using this for a long time. After we discover something, become very happy. They redesigned experiments. So the data analyzed was redesigned. So first, I was very impressed by Chen Ru. I got two of my, uh, Anna, who is a postdoc now, UC Irvine, Omar, still with me, to redo the segmentation. We did human annotation compared with the automatic Chen Ru, and actually her algorithm came out pretty well. So that passed. I was very impressed. I mean, she was a mechanical engineer. Right, just do things. And then that's where we hit the jackpot, at least in our credibility. So we'll look at more videos. I'm sure they look at videos. You see this humongous something moving. And this thing is counted every frame once. So this was counted like 40 times. And the small ones, the zoom, get counted once. Remember, we, count, we care about the cell size. If this is going to really skew our results. And they didn't know that. It turns out that some cells, the force is not, didn't separate. So it's like clumps of cells. So we end up deleting the big cell. And we also find small fragments. Sometimes, because she applied the force for the cell to move, right? And then we can count and separate them. Some become fragments. They're not really cells. So we, we basically did a robust statistics, trimming, take top off and down. But I usually don't want to just do a statistic. I want to look at the whole thing. So it's not just the average change. You see a whole shift. So we silence CCDC and the growth factor, both of them, and we see a shift of the cell size across the sizes. And this is the QQ plot, right? And this is the most uh, substantial evidence than the train mean. We do have to do some you know, formal testing. And we also did some um, ANOVA stuff. It's really, I want to see. And then um, we had actually Four sets of experiments among the five we did, we see strong causal evidence. And then took another eight months, try to come up with possible mechanistic explanations, why this interaction we found. It turned out it's not transcription factor inter binding, we think, oh, it's mediating, it's not a protein interaction, it's transcription factor binding. And brought new collaborators, brought new um, data. So it's mainly the work of Chen Ru and, and Tiffany and Yuan. Actually, I should update. So actually, we sent it to um, Nature Medicine didn't feel it's a fit, so now it's Nature Cardiology. And just a shout out to my main collaborators. It came back, we're just doing the revision now. So if you summarize what we did through the PCS uh, framing, we did a random split because uh, we didn't think the people, so the, the people we use already removed the relatives and all of that from UK data bases. They are not related as, as much as we know. And then we do a domain inspired dimension reduction. We use uh, GWAS and we did a prediction check. Otherwise, we wouldn't have to do uh, classification. So if you don't, Make sure you have some signal. You don't need to do all the other things because we have very, very weak signal. We tried multiple methods too, and turns out that surf on average give the best prediction performance and stable across different thresholds. And then we did a switch check across binary thresholds and with experiments. So, um, and a lot of work is more UN's lab's work to find biological interpretations, the, 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 the genes and interaction we find. So let me just mention quickly another study with uh, MD Anderson uh, researchers. So this is a huge group of people. We end up working more directly with the guy on the bottom, uh, Sam Hanashi's lab, and with also uh, and the guy, Professor Frankhart, the one with the red shirt, and then the top three people, the young people who basically worked on it, and it sounds about statistician, Anna and Tiffany, who visited more advisors through the documentation. And this is try to deal with a very difficult cancer. Pan pancreatic cancer usually is found very late stage. 85% cannot be operated on when it's discovered. So the death rate is really high. And we're looking at a new frontier, which is metabolism, uh, metabolites from blood-based. And the paper finally published in uh, Cell Reports, and the editors liked it and wrote the editorial on it. So this is a huge achievement. It's a huge team of people. And what our contribution was really bring the PCS thinking, right? We didn't do random split because here you want 
the centers means hospitals because whatever you develop will be applied to other hospitals. So we should not just always do random. You get too good a result if you split the, 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 the data from different hospitals in training. The other is time-based, right? Sometimes you want to time series. You, you don't want to split random again. You want to do a time prediction. And domain information came in, there's a thousand different metabolized measurements. And because pancreas has a role in digestion, and there's evidence that metabolites actually related to microbial, right? Microbial had a lot to do with digestion. So we focus on the 14 microbial related metabolites. And because the PCS frame set and mindset, we always consider multiple methods. They just like logistic regression. And we consider many other methods. And turns out logistic regression with the L1 penalty give the best result, increase the accuracy by 6%. And we only need three metabolites from this 14. And then we, of course, uh, also used uh, the non-microbial panel. And we did stability check on perturbations and also subgroups. So the diabetes group, actually, this is consistent. For diabetes and non-diabetes, we have similar results. This is also kind of stability you can think of could be fairness too for different economic groups, right? Stability is closely related to fairness. And the guy, uh, and it's because he has validation data. So we got another study and then got independent cohort. And if you combine with the non um metabolites, we were able to increase the accuracy by from the current um, marker used in clinical practice by 18%. So this is substantial. And diabetes didn't confound with the uh, metabolites. So the current direction PCS, we try now prove, you know, we do stability. It's kind of a holistic perturbation. We don't have confidence coverage, all of that. So now I'm trying to push for something a little more quantitative. We have software, reflow to make stability analysis easy so you don't have to program a lot. We also have a simulation uh, package to so make simulation for different structure easy because sim C in PCS is all the CS stuff, right? Speed, memory, communication, but it's also about we added something called data inspired simulations and stable. We want to simulate multiple models and see how your method works based on the same data. And for that, we're working on, just look at prediction areas now enough. Because when you simulate your model, you need a lot more. So you're looking at subgroups and look at residual plots. So the P got expanded beyond just like average prediction accuracy. Per prediction is not bad. And we have a documentation template extension by others. So again, remember that two pink elephants we need to get rid of. And the recommendation is at least you should do two copies of cleaned and the multivert analysis. Actually, many of the people here actually are Bayesian, it's very Andrew Gelman. So we kind of have similar thoughts, but I don't think they consider multiple cleaning uh, methods. Um, how they mind? And scientists are way ahead of us. This is 1990 in the IPCC report. They have this plot to predict average global temperature rise in 100 years from 1990. So this is 2090. They didn't have one prediction. This is not confidence interval or um, prediction interval. This is nine models. Nine leading groups in the world predicted a temperature from 1.5% uh, degree centigrade to 5.5 centigrade. Right, so this is already kind of perturbation interval. This is a team effect. They use similar data, similar PDEs, but they just do things a little differently maybe resolution. So they're already having these uh, perturbation intervals right there. So we're now moving for quantification perturbation intervals. And we're moving away really thinking that p-value should be trusted like conclusively. We're, we're really seeking evidence in a transparent, trustworthy manner for domain experts to make decisions together. And we want them to be able to evaluate the strengths of our evidence. And we definitely need to do more model checking and account for more sources uncertainty. So the 2020 paper already have basic PCS inference ideas, but not enough. It's the model checking and look at perturbations. And the C includes data-inspired simulations. 
So right now what's going on is that the book I will uh, end with, it with Rebecca Butter, who now at Utah Medical School, my former student, we already have prediction perturbation interval, chapter 13 of the book, taking into account data cleaning and also multiple choices. For the parameter estimation is a project in my group. We have to, because to evaluate coverage, theoretically you assume a true model. Here, we don't want to assume true model. We simulate data inspired simulation model and multiple them and look at the coverage. And then we look at the minimum of the cards just to be robust. robust. Uh, because we don't know what's the true model really. So we consider multiple of them. And the software, this is the people who uh, really did the work. And we build on, uh, VFlow is Python. We build on a lot of good uh, packages, MLflow and Ray for distribution from the CS Rice Lab in Berkeley. SimShelf is in R. It's made, you can easily just click and simulate different linear models. You can explore different structure more easily than you have to write a lot of code. And we have a template to write a report. Just make it easy. Then uh, people have to do a lot of um, ground up coding. It would be nice to have a Python version. Maybe right now we don't. It would be nice to have a VFlow R version. I think it's a preference of the people who did it. Some like R, some like Python, so you see it. And the documentation is at my website. And you can see that just help you to organize yourself, right? Just it's pretty typical. All the good scientists do it. But this is just for beginners, even for yourself. Some of you forget one thing. Even I sometimes forget one thing. This just get organized and you get a report, like a notes pretty quickly. So you can revise the, the questions by something more tailored to your problem, but they just make the documentation more systematic. So to summarize, PCS has multiple roles and really need more people to work on it. Why is internal validity, right? Through prediction checks, extended stability check, and expanded uncertainty. And then we do recommendation for ex external study, randomized trials or knockdown experiments. Oh, you look at the paper um, method, you stress test to follow the redo that the analysis. And you can also develop a new algorithm, right? RF is a new algorithm. You can also have new methodology. And the extensions by um, colleagues. So we're really good network analysis by Tian Zheng's group and we follow some learning by Susan Murphy's group. We're vertical spatial system by a group of ecologists from Arizona, people actually I don't know, right? So this is um, some people are doing some beginning strategy beyond what I said. And my former postdoc, uh, Dominic uh, Ranshaller from Stanford doing something, I think along this line. And our work was really analyze a particular method. And I was talking to Arthur uh, Gretton, who was at the meeting, and they're kind of doing something stability, right? They try to combine multiple statistics. In particular, two sample tests, we're talking about the testing front, how to do PCS. We have a paper called IP3, which is robustified testing for epistasis uh, discovery using tree-based, not polynomial, it's particular for genetics. So that's being re uh, revised for uh, plus one. A bunch of papers go to my website. I'm trying to list um, for the papers. I actually have a little note that PCS related to make it a little easier. And the software, you, up, up you have a code. You can see all the software on GitHub. Many, some of our papers actually, are, and we have that gone to JAWS, Journal Open Source Software. So we publish there. And then we have another line on decision trees, which I models is really, pretty good uh, tree-based method, not just us, also other people. So if you introduce the tree-based method and uh, look at the I models package and help contribute. And it's on AWS Auto Glowyang, so we'll put it on the machine learning platform through uh, Alex Smola's group. I think Alex has less, but uh, so my hope is that more people in the community will join us to do the vertical data science and to cite the uh, MD Anderson uh, collaborator he said, at the dawn of the AI era, it's extremely valuable to have a unified language and framework to talk about stress tests in the analysis pipeline. And I gave a talk at the uh, early cancer detection PI meeting at the NIH. Now we're thinking about the world invited to do a software like a grant to put a lot of ideas for at least cancer detection in a specific area. And we're holding a Rick Stanford John works on the first one on vertical data science, um, May 31st. I don't know, I'm hopeful can we, in just one day and to build a community around the vertical data science. 
And if you really want to learn more, we took 80 years to write this book. I hope uh, will be a free online copy available in a couple of weeks. It's an MIT Press, and they really believe in this approach they put in the machine learning series, uh, edited by Francis Bach. And this covered the whole data science life cycle from data cleaning, problem formulation. It's aimed at the upper division. It goes really well with a traditional book. We don't try to replicate a lot of great math type of books, try to be complementary. I use this for a PhD level uh, statistics, but I do a lot more than this book, but the basic ideas are there. And it's try to cultivate quantitative uh, critical thinking. And we have codes, we have three types of homeworks, conceptual, math, and also uh, code and data analysis. So check it out. Just check in February my website, I'll put a link there. And MIT Press was very generous to allow us to put before the hard copy appear, you know, because that would be a year delay if we wait for the hard copy. So it was very generous of them. They're banking on this, actually bring more attention to the book. So I, I think they're still banking on making money, but um, it was nice of them to allow us. So Rebecca Bader, again, my collaborator, very brave of her to join this project with me while she was a PhD student. And it was an eight year journey. So um, I definitely believe in it. So hope you guys check it out and become useful for teaching here. Thank you all. Thank you.